Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, good evening, and I'll call the meeting to order. This is the December regular meeting of the Incorporated Village of Sag Harbor. Uh, we have an agenda, um, and we're going to um, start uh, formally, and then uh, we'll be joined by Ed Hollander, who is the uh, landscape architect for uh, about half of the things you see around uh, the South Fork but he is the uh, architect for the um, Steinbeck Park landscaping plan. He did the uh, landscaping of the church on the Arts Church on Madison Street. Um, and uh, he is uh, traveling tonight, but uh, the plan is he has a presentation. Uh, these are some uh, recent, uh, um, or, or not so recent actually, but uh, enlargements of the uh, artwork, the conceptual uh, con uh, conceptual drawings uh, and renderings that were done uh, three or four years ago now when we set out on this journey to make Steinbeck Park. And in the early stage, um, we uh, fought our way through the CPF process, took a couple of years. Um, we eventually uh, got hold of 135 Ferry Road uh, for Steinbeck Park under Community Preservation Fund, uh, fund from Southampton Town. And uh, once uh, the title was in hand, uh, we were able to take down the derelict buildings that were there, uh, which we were happy to do. Uh, one of them was a more complicated task than we originally realized that was accomplished. Uh, the property was uh, already cleared for the most part. It's a waterfront uh, set. We took out non-native species. Uh, we began searching for money and grants and all of that. And Ed persisted all through that period of time. Uh, and uh, we were just getting into higher gear when COVID came along. And so we lost uh, some momentum during that period, uh, but we're back in business. Um, and uh, uh, many have noticed that the um, uh, landscaping work is underway again. And uh, earlier this year, we uh, were able to install a, a boardwalk, a walkway that goes from the beach at Steinbeck Park, which is on the entry to the cove, uh, under the Harder Bridge and all the way around to uh, the Long Wharf and Windmill Beach. We see them as all interconnected parts of this parkland along the waterfront. And uh, the first stage of the boardwalk was completed. Uh, we're after money for the second and third stages of that. And in the meantime, um, we've started work in the last couple of weeks on the plan for an informal amphitheater, if you will, above the beach. Um, and uh, I've worried from the beginning that the word amphitheater is bigger than what we have in mind. Uh, don't think Greek <laughs> columns or anything like that. It's just to uh, take advantage of the natural configuration uh, of the uh, waterfront above the beach. Um, and when we put the walkway in this year, we added uh, all kinds of native species, weeds, if you will, but they're beach weeds <laughs> with an honorable past. And uh, it's beginning to fill in um, the property along the uh, um, uh, western uh, end of the property is now planted with the very large, um, I guess they're arborvitae, uh, Ed will tell us. Um, and then uh, uh, we uh, were the beneficiaries of donated soil when we started all this a couple of years ago. The problem was the soil was what they call um, wood dirt. And it was a ground up wood with mixed in with soil. And the consequence of that is we, uh, for a while it looked like we were creating a, uh, a replica of Arizona desert. Um, and we've, <laughs> we've got now the, the piles of uh, topsoil that are out there the, uh, to be uh, introduced um, in this season. And uh, then to, um, in the spring, uh, bring in uh, additional vegetation. And so there's a lot going on. Um, Cassie had to step out. We were having trouble getting Ed connected. Um, and uh, can't do it, okay. Um, we can 
let's take a few we're just, we're just going to work our way along and see if um, the technical problem is solved so uh, I called the meeting to order already I would ask for um, a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting on November 8th 2022 a motion to approve the minutes from the special meeting held on November 30, a motion to approve the minutes from the special meeting held on December 7. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. And all those, in, is there a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. The motions are agreed to. Um, I will begin with the mayor's report and interrupt as soon as we've got Ed uh, on the wire. Um, I'll tell you this, uh, in the last two weeks, Ed um, made a trip out and back to um, Korea, and then a second one out and back to Taiwan. So um, assuming he knows where he is, we can connect with him, but he's actually back in New York. Um, the, um, the report I would make as part of the mayor's report is... Um, to, to come up before we are working toward the um, uh, we are in uh, the development stage of uh, what would ultimately be a local law to create a rental registry for the village. Um, we are uh, very influenced by the terrible tragedy that happened in Noyak. Um, we have uh, spent the time from then forward examining all of the uh, processes that our neighbors use and elsewhere in the state uh, for um, uh, regulating, reasonably regulating the rental activity in a residential community to assure the safety of people who rent. Um, and um, the processes are logical uh, that one would, uh, as a village government, want to uh, ensure, require that uh, owners who put something out for rent, uh, put it out in a safe manner in accordance with all of the codes that exist. Um, the problem uh, is reducing that to something that is uh, enforceable and effective. And uh, one of the parts of the tragedy in uh, Noyak was that wh whatever existed on paper, there was a gap between that and what was actually in the house. And so um, we will have a proposal for the village coming forward uh, as soon as uh, uh, January. That good looking fellow in that very good looking shirt and that very unusual tie is Ed Hollander. <laughs> there you go. Can we hear you? Can, can you, you hear me? We yeah. can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, and I can hear you. Thank I. I appreciate Cassie's perseverance with a man of absolutely zero technical abilities. Well, welcome, Ed. And I did a little bit of an intro. Uh, we've got some of the artwork here and uh, uh, the rest can come up on the screen. So um, it is yours. Okay. Um, gr greetings to all of my friends in Sag Harbor. Um, just an update on where we are in the park today. Um, we are following through on the plans that were developed. Um, we had a, a, a group of design meetings, I think when Kathleen was first mayor, that included representatives from Save Sag Harbor and the partnership and, and many of the village boards who gave valuable advice and input into the design. Um, one of the things that still shows in some of the plans and renderings is the bird tower um, that everyone kind of agreed might have been a little bit too much. So without redoing all the drawings, that's something that is that is off the table right now. What we are currently working on and what you can see out there right now is this kind of um, small sloped kind of seating area. If there was a better word for a small amphitheater, I would figure out what it is and use that perhaps an amphitheater. A smaller version, but it's similar in in the way. If anyone's familiar with the church, kind of how we did the sloped ground with some stone seating in there, um, they've done some rough grading on that. I found what we're going to use for our benches is we found some beautiful native boulders out in Montauk that they're putting through a stone saw, 
and slicing into six inch, six inch thick slabs of native stone that will then get set onto the flat terraces of the amphitheater that will provide the seating areas there. And we hope to have about 20 or 25 of these set into there. And then there'll be some other reclaimed chunk granite that will give us steps that you can see in the plan kind of coming up out of there. Um, depending on the weather, that's something that we hope to have done in the next four to six weeks. Um, the various piles of topsoil that were dropped all around there, like Martians invading Sag Harbor, will all get moved into the corner of the property, um, kind of at the corner between the old 7-Eleven building and the Bialski um, um, condominium project as a stockpile area. That will then get spread over the finished area um, before we get some fescue sod to put it down. We're gonna have two or three grows of native red oak trees to start to give us some shade over this area, all of which we hope to have 100% complete and ready for everyone to use by about May 1. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, I would invite, um, we'll be very informal. Anybody with a question or a comment for Ed, we will do that. Or a compliment. Or a compliment, yeah, well, well don't, don't get carried away here now. My time, my good looks, anything, I'm happy. I'm open to any, any, good, any good thoughts. Um, the uh, boardwalk uh, that, uh, just talk for a minute about the dimensions and uh, what our thoughts are about it, uh, benches that we would be putting in the boardwalk area and along the outer edges, at least, of the uh, property. Well, I think the partnership has sold four benches there, which, uh, you know, what we're looking at is a is a country casual teak Windsor six foot long bench, um, which we could set at the the back edge of the boardwalk. There's probably room for three or four on each side, leaving the center area open. Um, and hopefully they can sell all of those and continue to raise funds for us that will allow us to continue with our work in the park. We would say that in doing the benches, we would be uh, echoing what's been done on Main Street uh, and Marine Park and elsewhere around town. Uh, the town has a version of it in Long Beach, which is where people donate a bench in memory uh, or in uh, recognition of a loved one or a family or or uh, some expression of gratitude. And uh, actually we've had four, uh, but there's, there's as many as 11 or 12 names now on the list that uh, want to go ahead with that. So that's something we will be accomplishing in these mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of participants. <laughs> Can we um, mute that? Can we, ask, can we ask whoever's dialed in to mute themselves? Um, All right, folks, uh, anybody, any? Uh, I, I have a compliment yeah, for Ed. Ed. Thank you for the great work. It looks wonderful in the renditions. And I can, even my limited imagination can see where it's going based on um, the, I'm not going to call it an amphitheater groundwork that's been done. Um, I do have a, I just, I want to make sure we also pay attention to and, and plan for the railings go around the walkway underneath the bridges as well. Right. Um, and whether, whether that's funded by us or anybody else, we need to, I think, address that sooner rather than later. Sure. Right. And I should say that the uh, boardwalk so far is meant to be ADA compliant. So the width and the flushness uh, to the uh, surrounding soil is all meant to make it fully ADA compliant. The rails are essential, particularly for the section that will go under the bridge, where they'll be directly above the channel, uh, and it'll be important. And then carry around to the north side, which faces out onto the waterfront. Um, we've uh, considering a range of possibilities from uh, the kind of railing we have on Long Wharf, which is gorgeous and very expensive, to a more conventional a beach rail. Uh, when you're over at the park, you'll see that there are two banisters 
uh, take to take people down to the beach from the boardwalk, and that's just a very conventional. Uh, it's good. It's a good timber, but it's a very conventional uh, beach rail. And uh, budget-wise, we're looking at that as one end of it, and uh, the uh, more ambitious, the cabled one, uh, if we can raise the money. But, uh, can, I may, can we? I'm sorry. Just to follow up on that, can we um, also plan to complete that by the May 1st target date as well? Uh, subject to um, money dropping from somewhere. Yes. Um, on that subject, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Ed for all the work he's done. This goes. This has been going on for a number of years now, and progress, um, as, as Mayor said, was interrupted by COVID, but it's great to see it uh, back, getting back on track. Um, we'll be looking at grant applications and grant opportunities once we get into the new year for the 2023 season to see if we can connect um, the bridge to the windmill somewhere along that, that bulkhead, because I think that's a big part of our ADA responsibility uh, to the village uh, to allow people to participate in Long Wharf and also be able to participate in the connection to the park without having to cross 114. Um, so that's something we'll be working on the new year. Um, and I'll keep you updated on that as, as progress dictates. Will Thank the grant you. provide for a railing? The grant would provide for railing to make everything ADA compliant, but not in the time frame that I'm afraid the world of granting doesn't work um, in a time frame where we might have something in time for May. Having said that, I will talk to Jen Messiano, our grant writer, and see if there might be something out there um, that's a little different than what we've been pursuing um, until now. I think that our concern, because me and Ed have talked about this, is that it's great that we're doing all this stuff and we're beautifying that area, but you know, our concern is that it's safe, that people, if you're going to start to funnel people under that bridge, that that railing needs to be in place. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just have one question. We, we sort of glossed over the payment and cost. Who's paying for this? Well, uh, Ed uh, Hollander, who you see sitting there, who's a very successful businessman, oh, has good. been paid exactly <laughs> nothing for his work now for the last <laughs> four or five years. Basically, Bob, we're getting almost all of this work done through contributions. Um, Diversified Services is providing all the sand for us. Ruddy Masonry is providing all of the stone for us. Um, DeSuno Excavation is providing all the topsoil to us, and I've had two different landscape contractors agree to provide the trees for us. So hopefully this gets done for the same amount that I'm getting paid to do it. <laughs> so the only payment we need is love. <laughs> okay, well that explains it. Thank you. And looking back, the other firms, the, uh, the demolition was... Uh, uh, paid for completely pro bono by the Mezzaniski firm. Um, the, uh, we've had a very um, strong uh, uh, WBE, Women's Business Enterprise, involved in the landscaping. And so uh, we've had a succession of um, public spirited uh, people making very substantial contributions in kind and pro bono. And uh, uh, going forward, we going to have to have that as part of uh, the next steps. But certainly, um, one of the things that now helps in the grant world is we have something to show for what we've got so far. And the partnership has been good. And I had a meeting with Jane Young and Herb Sample and, and Susan Mead. And I think they're going to come back and, and, and work with us to try and raise funds for the park as well. Lots of love to go around. That's great. <laughs> All you need is love. All we need is love. Um, Try to it. That's what your tie says. Just love. It's your tie. It's your tie. Yes. It, just, it screams love. It screams love. <laughs> it says. I don't do any screaming. <laughs> He's a mild mannered fellow. Anybody else uh, have a comment or a question? All right. Uh, Ed, thank you for squeezing us in between yep. Korea and Taiwan, and uh, welcome home. I'll be, be back out on Friday. Okay, well, I'll alert the police. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, yes. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't want to give him too swelled a head, but uh, I've worked with a lot of people. Uh, his generosity has been extraordinary. 
uh, and his family has joined in in terms of actual contributions. Uh, so uh, we are in very good hands uh, with Ed Hollander. Um, to pick up my report, um, I mentioned that we are working toward a rental registry. Um, I want to very briefly mention that uh, the Article 78 litigation goes forward. Uh, it's in the very early stages, um, and uh, we are uh, engaged in responding to that. Um, the gas ball lot has been in the news. We had an agreement reached with the uh, company, a national grid, which had awarded the, um, uh, the gas ball lot, which we use for almost 100 parking spaces uh, on Bridge Street, uh, to uh, a for-profit uh, LLC. Uh, I've campaigned with them over the year uh, to reassign it to us. We were almost there. Um, the owner or the owner of the lease um, uh, uh, had a change of heart uh, based on the litigation that's out there. And so we've taken the path to the Public Service Commission, which has the power and responsibility uh, in protecting the public interest to assure that the disposition of that property is in the public interest. Our argument is that it is not if it is given to a for-profit when you have a municipal government that has had possession of it now for six or seven years. Uh, we use it every day, we use it every night, and it's a very important component of our st strapped uh, parking inventory in the village. So we are, um, uh, before the Public Service Commission, we uh, gained party status last week, and uh, uh, the village attorney is uh, leading that effort, and uh, we'll have more to say as, that, as we go along. For the moment, our possession and control of the lot continues while this action is before the Public Service Commission. So the uh, December 31 uh, expiration of our current lease has been um, set aside. So we will be in possession uh, at least until the uh, TSC uh, completes its case and uh, the company has expressed uh, agreement with that schedule. So for the moment, nothing changes. We'll certainly get through this season uh, with that parking in place. Um, the uh, uh, departmental uh, uh, reports that I will make uh, start with the building department. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the year and um, uh, recall that uh, a year ago in the fall, uh, under the leadership of Chris Talbot, our building inspector who could not be here tonight because he is also a fire commissioner in Kutchog where he um, uh, had to be this evening. Um, but we're coming up on the end of the year uh, with a, uh, a total um, that is already in the neighborhood of $850,000 generated by the uh, fee structure that we put in place a year ago. And so that's very substantial and it is giving us uh, some room to uh, uh, throughout uh, this small village government to make some improvements um, in um, various ways. And we'll have more to say about that as we get into the budget season. Uh, the new budget season starts for us after the first of the year. And uh, I think we'll be able to demonstrate that these uh, new incomes are being well, um, uh, well placed. Um, and um, the uh, looked like a period there for the last few months of the summer where the level of activity was easing off. And it did a little bit, and it's still a relative number of applications to a year ago, but it's still at a very high level. It's still uh, 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 the development pressure on the village remains very high. Um, that's the, um, you know, the other side of that story. Um, the uh, report of the um, uh, code enforcement, uh, where we are out there uh, enforcing our building codes and watching carefully what goes on on the, on the uh, construction sites and so forth, um, had a pretty vigorous month. Um, the uh, also got in some training for our team and um, uh, dealt with a couple of uh, uh, awkward um, events. So there was a gas leak in the, res in the residence that had to be responded to safely, and it was and, and eliminated. Um, so the department's been busy. 
um, and uh, finishing the year uh, uh, nicely staffed and with uh, uh, the, uh, the team that uh, Chris has assembled um, out there really get doing a terrific job. Um, the um, Department of Public Works has been very busy um, and uh, will tell you that if you are downtown tomorrow, there will be sidewalk work underway from uh, Budaberry on the east side of the street all the way down to Village Hall. So uh, if you notice the last couple of days, they did the serious sidewalk work on the stretch of Madison on the west side above the village to Union Street, um, accomplished basically in two days with a very good looking finish um, and um, I would say successful um, traffic management during that. Um, the street had, uh, did not have to be closed, but it was managed with one lane for a couple of hours. And uh, at the same time this week, the um, village completed the um, uh, installation on um, Washington Street of the um, uh, new section of um, uh, piping uh, buried in the street. Um, we had had a problem there, unexpected. Uh, that was dispatched. Um, um, it's part of uh, uh, the story of an age, aging village that uh, these things pop up and they're never on the schedule you would choose. Um, um, in public works, the um, <clears throat> fall leaf program is over. Uh, <clears throat> it ran a little late this year because of the uh, high rainfall, the leaves didn't fall on the schedule we published, but they eventually did fall. Um, the, um, and I mentioned the, uh, the new sewer main uh, went into Washington Street without incident. Uh, PSAG has started their electrical upgrade project here and there around the village. Um, they're in a section now from Sag Harbor Bridge, Hampton Turnpike to Germain, and then to Suffolk and to Sag Road. Uh, this will uh, stretch out over four to six months. Um, again, these are projects that we try to do without wholesale closing of a, of a thoroughfare. Um, there's a lot of patching going on uh, in preparation for the winter. Uh, we've got a good quantity of sand and salt on hand. Uh, we managed to get through this blizzard this morning very easily because it lasted about 20 minutes and melted in an hour. So that's the kind of storm we like. Um, and the street sweeper is still out there. The winter hasn't slowed that down. Um, and uh, the, another part of the work of the department has been to support the work that's going on in Steinbeck Park. Um, the deliveries, the management of uh, all of that soil, uh, all of those things um, have uh, kept uh, the uh, department uh, engaged uh, along the way as well. Um, the uh, uh, docks and water uh, harbor rather are, are, are filling, uh, finishing up the season in very good shape. Um, the winterization of the docks is almost complete. We have ice eaters being placed at Marine Park, Marine Park Basin, and A and B docks. Uh, they're not um, the entire structures, but there are sections um, where they are in place. Um, the dinghy docks were moved into Marine Park Basin. The transient docks have been moved to the area of B dock. So our floating docks have essentially been taken out of the water uh, for the winter. Um, there's only one dock that still needs ice eaters is the main dock at the transient dock and the pilings on the west side of that dock. Uh, that's a permanent structure. Um, we've also added 10 pile mates. Those are the sleeves on the, uh, pillow, the uh, pilings that you see um, here and there around Marine Park. Um, and uh, a couple of them had to be replaced. They got beat up pretty well this year. Um, the uh, cost of running the ice eaters has come up in the past. It's a necessary cost to pre pre prevent much more expensive problems as we go forward. Um, 
at Havens Beach, all of the vessels have uh, been removed by their owners. There's one kayak left. It was brought to the impound lot. Um, uh, we did this last year and getting all the boats out of there makes the management of Havens Park uh, and the um, attractiveness of it through the winter months uh, much better. Um, and it also allows with the boats out of the way, cleaning of those sections, which is being accomplished. Um, we have two vessels still out there in the outer mooring field. The owners have been notified and advised to remove them as the season ended officially on October 31. Um, it looks like we'll finish the year about $215,000, $220,000 uh, ahead of last year. So another department where a successful season has developed some additional revenues uh, for the village. Um, a lot of demand for those revenues, of course, um, particularly on the waterfront, uh, but um, uh, a good season. And uh, Bob is here tonight. I want to mention that we are trying to advance the next level of work for the transient dock. The transient dock is the one that lies to the west of Long Wharf. And uh, there's uh, uh, the American Queen that takes people on tours. Uh, the, the launch service works out of there. Uh, we have a very <coughs> loyal set of visitors. Uh, and um, Bob, what percentage is already reserved for the summer? Uh, Officially reserved uh, January second. Right. So uh, we are pursuing uh, a necessary, significant investment in renewing the transient docks. Uh, we're looking to the grant world. Uh, we've uh, uh, putting out an RFP to see what uh, uh, resources are available to us, but. Uh, it is our hope that we'll get the transient docks upgraded uh, for the coming season, just as we did, I guess, two or three years ago where we redid uh, all of B dock. And uh, this past summer where uh, we resurfaced Marine Park dock. So there's always a capital demand to keep these facilities safe and uh, attractive. And uh, you'll hear more about the transient dock as we go. Um, that uh, completes uh, uh, the departmental reports for me. Let me mention one thing that'll be coming up in there and we have an action item on it. And that is we're acutely concerned about the uh, continuing ec economic impacts on um, our ability to house people, to find places for young people uh, and to attract quality people uh, here. And we're coming off a year where officially the year will end with a 7.2 um, or 7.3% growth in the cost of living over last year. So a little, little later in the meeting, I will, um, we will offer a uh, inflation adjustment for the, uh, the staffs, the police of um, uh, village workers and public works and highways and so, so forth uh, to provide some assistance to them as we uh, work our way through this very um, difficult period of inflation uh, in the economy. Um, and uh, that will conclude uh, the mayor's report uh, by department. And I would turn it to the deputy mayor for the police department, fire department, ambulance corps, public safety. The treasurer's report. Uh, I skipped over the treasurer's report. I seem always to do that. Um, Tim Bullock. Report. Um, this is the treasurer report for October 31, 2022. Uh, the revenues are still up over the prior year, um, mostly due to the building department uh, fiscally. They're up 136,000. Um, in October, we also received some donations to the police department for equipment, along with donations towards the purchase of a new fire boat with the fire department. Uh, as for expenditures, we're about 40% of our budget in October. Um, we made uh, our annual contribution to the fire service award program for 423,000. Uh, we also had some repairs to our salt trucks in preparation for the winter season, um, along with the payments uh, that we made for repairs for Burke, Madison, and Grand for $40,000 for um, payments. 
And then we also have repairs for collapsed drains, pipe for 6,000. And then just due to timing, um, our, our help um, billing is down this month just because of uh, the way the pay cycle fell. So uh, October payments are be coming up uh, next cycle. Um, and that's the treasury report. Thank you, Tim. Um, Thank you. Any questions for the treasurer? All right, thank you. And now the deputy mayor. Tom. Thank you, Mayor LaRocca. I'll start with our police department. And before I get to reading the numbers, I'll just make mention that our police force was um, involved in solving a uh, break-in crime. crime. There was uh, a break-in into a home in the village and uh, it was over a million dollars worth of proceeds were taken, including cash, jewelry, wine, and some firearms. And our police force working with the state police was able to apprehend um, two individuals, one from Manhattan and one from Connecticut that had uh, perpetrated this crime. So I just wanted to make mention of our police force doing a, a rather quick job. I mean, the burglary came on September 25th and just recently, a couple of weeks ago, the arrests were made. So it was really good police work. So thank you to AJ and to the police officers. Right, allegedly. Thank you, Council. <laughs> That's why I always like to have my council friends sitting next to me. So getting to the numbers, uh, we had uh, 700, the Santa Carver Police Department had 728 calls for service in the month of November. We had one aggravated unlicensed operation, uh, one suspended registration. We had nine motor vehicle accidents. We had three arrests, one DWI arrest. We had 59 uniform traffic tickets issued. And in addition to that, we had 78 parking summonses issued. So those are the numbers for our police department. Uh, also, while I'm on the subject of the police department, we've uh, gone out to a couple of architects to redesign the locker room area in the police station to accommodate the female officers. Right now, they're in a tight spot and we wanna make it more comfortable for them. So that will be a project that'll be coming up in the future. Uh, I'll move on to the fire department. In the month of November, the fire department volunteered for over 643 man hours. During the month, the officers and members of the department responded to 41 calls of service. These calls included two gas leaks, three motor vehicle accidents, and one carbon monoxide incident. So on that note, I would just mention to the public, please check your carbon monoxide detectors. We're into heating season now. And if there's anything faulty with the system, we want to make sure that those monoxide detectors are functioning and they pick up uh, any readings to keep you safe. So please check the batteries, make sure they're operating properly. In the month of November, the Santa Carver Fire Department continued training with the department drill in Yapank for low rise commercial buildings. We also did an LP gas training at the East Hampton Town Training Center and the members of the department helped kick off the holiday season by participating in the Parade of Lights in Southampton this year. Uh, we're also, uh, just to make mention, we had another meeting on the fire EMS building, uh, which is developing rather quickly. We have a floor layout plan of the building and it's still in the works. We're moving things around, but that project is moving forward with H2M. We also had uh, I had, there was, we had gotten a $250,000 grant to put into the existing firehouse for the kitchen. We had it repurposed towards the purchase of the fireboat. So working with Fred Deal, he helped us get that grant repurposed. So now that $250,000 will go towards the, the purchase of the fireboat. I believe at this time we're about at $120,000. We've collected through donations around that number. And uh, we have a pledge for another $100,000. So that gets us, I would say, to about 220. We need to match the 250 in order to get it. So we're pretty much, we're almost there with those funds. So we're, that's progressing along very well. So let's hope we can get that boat very soon. Or at least be 
finalize the what it's going to be in the get to get that in motion. Uh, that'll move on to the ambulance report. So for the month of November, the ambulance uh, had 984 man hours, 70 emergency calls in the month of November. We had four work nights, two meetings, 13 training sessions. Uh, last November, 2021, we were at 1,025 man hours. On November 6th, we had uh, what we call work day where we took all the equipment out of all the ambulances, the both ambulances we have and the first responders, made sure that nothing was expired, changed any equipment that we had to change, cleaned the vehicles, restocked them. Uh, and we had an inspection on November 14th by the state and we, the inspector was very impressed. We passed the inspection with flying colors. So I'd like to thank the volunteers of the Ambulance Corps for, for doing an excellent job on that. And uh, that would conclude my reports to the Emergency <clears throat> Services Mayor. Great. Uh, thank you, Tom. The um, uh, report of the Sewer Department and Village Grants, uh, Trustee Korsh. Thank you, Mayor. I will start the report for the sewage treatment plant for November 22. Total gallons received 1.687 million gallons were treated in the plant, and we removed 22,500 gallons of sludge for further uh, treatment. Uh, DMR reports were forwarded on 12-13. Uh, Suffolk County DHS inspection date, the next inspection is gonna be the 9th of January. As always, the New York State DEC inspection dates are open, and we had no complaints throughout the month of November. Uh, summary of operations, wastewater treatment plant running well and is under all permitted levels, and we're operating on three of the five available basins. Uh, we had two alarms for the waste pump in basin number four. Uh, we reset the breaker, checked the pump for debris, and everything was okay. We had a blockage on Long Island Avenue and Bridge Street. We called Quackenbush, pump out the sewer line, um, and also had to roto jet the line for plant uh, routes that infiltrate um, at the joints between the, some of these, some of our sewers are three foot long clay pipes that have a connection every three feet. So they're subject to root infiltration. Uh, we did a camera and we camera the line afterwards and everything was clear. Um, we had another grease trap inspection and we had 10 fails. So this is something that we've talked about. That's just, a, it's just unacceptable. I don't know how to describe it. It's a responsibility of every restaurant or every premises or every operation in this village that has a grease trap that they, that they pump it out. It causes untold damage and, and, and expensive consequence at the plant and the pipes. So there's something we really wanna work on. Right now we have very little, our enforcement is to shut the premises down altogether, which I think is draconian. And we need something in between sort of zero and, and, and 100 miles an hour so that we can in, encourage people. Um, and maybe it's a name and shame uh, it's to get this out there because this is going on for way too long and it's costing the village a lot of money. Uh, we sent about $7,000 taking grease out of, the, out of the pipe up by the, uh, the uh, top of Main Street uh, only a month ago. And so having had all that conversation and having had it sort of aired out in public to have 10 fails is a lot. Um, so we had a new influent valve finally was installed into tank number one this week. That was a, a, a major piece of equipment that had failed and we have been using a valve from another tank that was offline. So now that we're back online with the new valve, uh, flow decrease from October to November is approximately 638,000 gallons. So obviously things get quiet. We'll expect it to pick up a bit over the holiday season. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, we had replaced a sewer pipe on Washington Street that went very successfully. Um, it's always difficult when we dig up the streets, especially in the downtown area, what you're going to find is never really what's represented on any of the drawings or sketches that are in our possession. But this went well, and so that street will be patched properly once it settles over, over time. Um, from a grant perspective, uh, we're still waiting for New York State, uh, I guess within the next week. So by, by the January meeting, I'll be able to report, hopefully, positively on three grant applications we have pending. Uh, two are for sewer treatment um, or sewer service expansion areas, area K and L, if anybody's been following that, uh, that process. And the third is for Haven's Beach to do a study of the watershed area um, so that we can better understand where the water that eventually comes into the green um, is coming from and what we might be able to do upstream to divert some of that and create a better water environment um, at Haven's Beach. Um, so I'll have more. We'll also begin the process of looking 
and what grants we might want to apply for next year. We mentioned earlier talking about the park and making that ADA connection from the wharf um, over, over to the bridge. Uh, a little later on, we're going to have a resolution on paid parking to the funds that we have accumulated over two years, $144,902.85 will be, we have a resolution to apply those funds to various projects around the village. I'd like to thank uh, our, our Deputy Mayor Goodell and Dee Yardley for helping to resolve how these funds might be uh, allocated. And so that will come up a little later on in the resolution. Thanks, Tom, for your help. On that. Mayor, that concludes my report. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, Trustee Plum, um, I should say, uh, you'll notice that the assignment with uh, Trustee Plum has changed a bit. He is now a liaison to the planning board. Um, and the uh, big assignment there is the planning board, which has been essentially a site plan review board, is taking on the lead in our uh, development of a broader comprehensive plan, master plan for the village. And so we're very uh, glad, Bob, that you've uh, gone over there uh, with that, uh, but it's still part of the affordable housing leadership um, that we've uh, had in place now for a year and a half. So uh, double Dutch, uh, and uh, thank you. All right, you're welcome. The only thing I have to say is I still am hoping to have a uh, public forum on planning in general, uh, which either in a board meeting or a separate meeting, Everyone will be invited to just give us input, direction. What do we want to preserve? What do we want to this and that? Just uh, broad topics, not site specific comments, just generally. So we have a sense, good sense, better sense of where we're going. We haven't done a lot of planning studies. We know how many parking spots there are. We know we have a lot of factual information, but we sort of need more of a, in my opinion, more of a philosophical um, approach to it. And I think that should come from the public. So that's what we're trying to uh, organize. And I'd like to aim toward uh, the second half of January to put that together. I'd like to see that as a separate meeting than a board meeting where we have more time to expand on well, we do, I think it'd be exclusive. It'd that's be exclusive. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's it for me. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Bob. And uh, finally, uh, Trustee Hay, Mash Park, Justice Court, and Affordable Housing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief. Um, not a lot has happened since the last board meeting to report on with MASH Park. Um, continuing negotiations, discussions with the school over um, capital improvements to the fields at the park. Um, but there's that's contingent on the progress that the school makes with the Marsden property as well. Um, with the and the park is also continuing to look at plan for capital improvements to the, the other facilities at the park. The existing structures there, for example, uh, the houses there um, is one, as well as the underneath of the grandstand. The grandstand roofing and, and the stands themselves were redone, and now they're looking at the structure underneath, locker rooms, bathrooms down below. Um, the Justice Court, um, the Deputy Mayor went through a lot of the violations that have been um, issued over the last month. Those all filter, most of those filtered to the Justice Court. Um, the one point I'll make about that is that we probably need to schedule a meeting at year end with the Justice Court to go through because there has been a consistent drop in in the amount of activity coming through the court and over $100,000 of revenues. This is now all the way back to 2015 levels, it looks like, as we get to year end, which is, could be great. Everybody's complying with laws and regulations and there are very few fines running through. Uh, that would be fantastic, but it'd be nice to know where the shortfalls are in which areas of, of the justice courts activities um, are happening, happened this year versus prior years. I'm hoping it's the paid parking. <laughs> That's it for the Nash Park and Justice Court report. Okay, thank you, uh, Ed. And I would hear a motion now to accept the uh, departmental reports, the mayor's report, and the treasurer's report. Is there a motion? I'll move it. And hey, is there a second? No, sir. Okay. Okay. Eight. Um, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The matter is agreed to. The reports are accepted. We will now have a 15 minute public comment period on the uh, reports that you just heard. 
And would you come forward if you would, uh, Kate, and um, identify yourself and tell us where you live. I have three questions. One is, I thought for the mayor, mayor one, um, that the, it was illegal for Sacramento Village to have a, a private parking lot in our code. It, it wasn't possible for anybody to take over a lot. I thought I read that in the paper. I wondered if that's true. We were uh, busy this week reminding the Public Service Commission that the deal that they made that that is was made between National Grid and uh, the owners of number five or number eleven Bridge Street is really not permissible under our code. So that we're asking the PSC to correct the transaction that cost us our place uh, with the parking, uh, and importantly, is not actually feasible uh, under allowable under the code. Right. I just want to clarify that for And the other thing I was wondering about, um, Mr. Gardella, if um, when the sirens go off, is the public allowed to know if there's three sirens, what it, what it means? So if you hear five sirens in a row, that means that there's that, that's a call for all the firemen to respond. So usually it's a, it's a gen, it's what they call a general alarm. And it's either a structure fire or a gas leak, something where the, all of the department is you know, asked to, to respond. I mean, I was down, this is a perfect example of why that's important. I was downstairs, my pager was upstairs, I'm in my kitchen doing something, and I hear the alarm, the, the, the whistle's going off. It was today, it was today. Right, so I immediately ran upstairs, turned the radio on and see, to see where it was, what was going on. So it's just another form of communicating to the firefighters, hey, let's go, something's, go, something's up here, so the pay attention. number of sirens has a different elevation of how general i mean other than the the 12 o'clock noon which is one siren which signifies 12 o'clock most of the time when that alarm goes off it's a general alarm okay so it's five it goes off right. and it's everybody yep. shows up right thank you and one other thing for Ms. Karish, does the grease trap problem with the restaurants does that did that contribute to having to replace the sewer line because obviously the grease traps no there's on that sewer line there are no restaurants attached to it and, and the problem with that was a de degraded and deteriorated clay pipe that had broken and so much of it had broken sometimes we can line the insides if it just cracked but the pipe is still holding in shape but this pipe was put in in the early to mid 80s and it's very shallow um, most of the pipes are much deeper, so it was taking a beating from trucks. And I'd say, How did you know it was broken? Um, we were getting constant backups problems um, from the, 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 the premises that are connectors to that pipe on Washington Street. And so having investigated every other possibility, you put a camera down and you can take photographs of the inside or film. So it, it was very obvious when we came to the part that was broken and it needed replacing. Okay. And hopefully it's good for another 75 years. Well, thank you. Thank you for clarification. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Uh, yes, Renee. I just wanted to tell you that uh, Renee Simon, since I got these um, even on your um, the question of grease traps, so mm -hmm. it's, it's another line I'm involved with board that um, gets this grease trapping issue. Right. My question is, can you attribute attribute it to a specific business, and if so, why can't you find them? We do attribute it to a specific business because the trap is inspected and that's that business's trap. So once the grease is in the pipe, it's, it, you know, we can't tell where it came from. But we, when we inspect the traps, we tell, you know, we give people warning they have to, and then we'll come back and reinspect and make sure that they are, they are now compliant. My issue with this, and we've spoken about this, is that the remedies that we have for non-compliance are to shut the premises down, just literally shut the restaurant down. I wish we need something that was in between so that we could that we could write a ticket um, and it would become so that's something we've spoken about and we're going to start working on so that we so that our inspectors have also wanted to bring code enforcement in because our workers at the who do the inspections I don't think are legally uh, entitled to write any sort of ticket we'll have to look at that we'll have to look at it but we it's just did upgrade the code to require the larger grease traps but that's not in place until right until so it, it's surprising because we've been inspecting i've been not doing this for five years with the village and it's recently it would appear that compliance has really fallen off a cliff 
I don't understand why, but that's this is the report I'm getting. Fine. Okay, can thank you. Can we avoid? I'm sorry, Kate. No. Um, I, it doesn't name the restaurants in the report that I have, and I'm not a big fan of naming and shaming. I want people right. to comply, no, and um, I presume there are. I think yeah. Other questions, comments? All right, that would conclude the public comment section um, and move on. There are no introductions or new local laws. Uh, we have a, a public hearing that has been opened uh, the last month or two uh, on uh, local law to consider the uh, establishment of the historic Black Beachfront Communities Overlay District. <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. As I'm saying, the um, the uh, public hearing is open, so I would invite anyone who wants to be heard um, to, in the continuing public hearing uh, to come forward. Yes. Um, first of all, the many assignments as I have these, I want to uh, provide some photo and just a few remarks. So I think there's six. So I'm we can share. Around. That's all right. Yeah, I'll have a nice Are you good? Okay, thank you. I'm not sure. Maybe two somewhere. Good. Good. Okay. Oh, here, I got an excellent one. Okay. Um, this is a picture of a house within the Sand Harbor area, uh, Sands area. And I present it to you because it's a house that is a contributing house to the historic. And um, I present it because it's a house. If you look at the house, it has a second level. This second level was put on within the last. I'm estimating like five, six years. When um, we were going to historic district, we noticed that this particular house was still contributing. And I asked the question, okay, I know we can put on second levels with historic district. Um, you, this house was contributing and you're still saying it's contributing. So the, the point I'm making is that with historic district, you can put on second levels. People have done that and still maintain their contribution. And I know that we talk about fenestrations and the windows. Look at the windows. They're not identical. But this was okay by the state of New York as a contributing house with the renovations that were done. So it is possible. And this is the choice of that particular owner. That owner is not happy with the local laws that they, she had to follow <laughs> to get that. It had nothing to do with the historic district. So I'm just giving this as an example of how our house can be renovated and still be in a historic district without any problem. And this, whatever that design was, was a design that had nothing to do with the historic district. It was a design that was preference of the owner. Um, the other thing I wanted to make uh, known is that people, uh, the proposal that is on, on the table right now I've already mentioned that it has unlimited demolition, which is a problem for the SANS um, organization. And also the fact that it's not permanent. Okay, that is it. Um, we know that with the historic district, you can demolish. We have two examples within the Eastville area that receive permission by the village to demolish homes. It is possible, but you don't have to have unlimited demolition. It has to be some type of uh, cause or reason or hardship. It's not hard to dig get, but you do have to do something to do it. So it's not impractical to, to have the historic district there. So I want to also talk about, um, I, I, the press is playing a big role in kind of recounting what people feel and opinions. And one thing that came up was that SANS organization um, that did the state and national uh, designation did not get endorsements from the subdivisions. That's not true. We went through all three subdivisions and we received unanimous membership approval at a meeting, at their regular meeting in the summer of 2016. We would never have proceeded without knowing that the subdivision memberships was not behind us. So you should know that as well. Um, a couple other things. You already know about the 150 people who signed a petition. 
Uh, I've also heard that people say, well, you only got 150. Well, we stopped because the then ARB chair, Tony Brand, said we only needed 51%. So once we reached it, we were literally knocking on individual house doors. Once we reached it, we met the standard and we thought that's all we needed to do. If we knew that in hindsight, people would say, we only got 150, why didn't we go for 200? We might have tried. But at the time, we met the standard, and so we stopped there. And then the last point in terms of um, in, uh, why we had the endorsement, we weren't loosey goosey about this, is that the state and the national sent three letters to each of the owners of the 300 plus homes, three letters, two from the state and one from the nas uh, from national and asked specifically, were there any objections? Out of those three mailings, only two objections were received by the state. And one of the two objections was rescinded once the person understood what was going. So I just wanted to start with that and then just a few remarks. And I'm gonna quote um, a 1968 Dr. King quote uh, from February of 1968. Cowdis asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because one's conscience tells it that it is right. I'll end the book there. And so, now talking to me, what is right here to me are the CLG procedures. You already know from um, information that I have previously provided that we have the certified local government documents. And I have quoted paragraphs within that that said, um, to maintain a system for the survey and inventory of historic properties, coordinated with and complementary to the survey activity of SHPO as the state organization. Local inventories shall include at a minimum, shall include at a minimum, all properties in a municipality that has been listed in the state and national registries of historic places. That's your duty as a CLG. The other point is owner consent uh, designation is not allowed with the CLG program. While some communities allow an owner to block designation of a property, this is not acceptable under the CLG program. Preservation ordinances are in line with other legislations enacted for the public good. Therefore, the designation and review processes assess the property for its importance to the general community. An owner can present information during the designation process, but cannot veto the designation. I know I've said it before, but I wanted to make it clear again. I also found out, and this is just background for you, because I know you asked for, well, how does this work? Even if the state is stripped of the village CLG tomorrow, let's say, or the village resigns as I no longer want to be in the business of the CLG, it still will not need to, you would still need as a village, need to honor what was in place in 2019, because that's when we were listed on the state and national registry. It doesn't dismiss it. When SANS was listed, as I said, on both. So what is not right is in accurately attributing state and national designations to HBBC. That's not listed. You go Google it, it doesn't exist. Also explicitly stating that the village will not do its job with uh, regard to historic district designation and put that in your local law. That doesn't make sense to me when you are CLG and you're mandated to list it. For the last almost seven years, the SANS <laughs> organization has stepped into the village's responsibility and carried the village on our backs and our raised resources to gain recognition for the planned communities within SANS. With the thankful in-kind work of a few, we hired experts engaged in voluminous research and interviews, and raised nearly $330,000 with partners and grantors to pay for the work. This was not cheap. We self-funded when the village refused to do that, to help us. Basically, the SANS organization 
with over 20 cross um, subdivision residents. It's not one, it's not five. We had over 20 across three subdivisions. And again, we had subdivision approval unanimously from their meeting during the summer of 2016. So we weren't doing this willy nilly. And we attended the village's contracted, we rather attended to the village's contracted CLG obligations for the SANS area, meaning this was the village's job. We went in and we stepped to do that to make this thing happen. And the past three village administrations knew this and all have all the records and documentation the village will ever need to act on the Sands Historic District local listing. On your part and on the part of your elected part of your elected duty, you have everything you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need proclamations, resolutions. All you need to do is add it to the inventory in the Chris system. Period. Know that this that know that this that you know this, and the village needed to sign off on the phases that phases of the state and national. You may not realize this that each time we did a step. The state would come back to the village and provide that information to the village for your files. You had the legal right at that point to stop the process. You agreed with the process. You even unanimously voted to encourage us to continue. Okay, and we did. There's no way to hide on this. This is your work, not ours anymore. We checked. What would the next step be? There is nothing anyone else can do. There's nothing that anyone else that, that is needed by you to do your duty, which is simply list us on your inventory. We followed up on, and we know this, we talked to people nationally and, um, I'm just saying domestically, it's my business, and, and locally. We followed up on the village's own documentation in 1994. And when it chose to neglect it until 2019, we did the work. After, after missing the required five-year inventory assessment for the past 26 years, the mandated 2019 village survey finally recognized the achievement and well-documented work of the SANS organization. You have a copy of that. You did not have to cover SANS in that 2019 survey because it was done. You had everything you needed on SANS. You didn't have to put one dime of resources or manpower to document. You did put mind, uh, money to it to do the 42 houses, which are now out there for the, these trustees at Alta Land. But you didn't have to do it with us because it was already in place. It was done for you. No one sitting here tonight in this room other than me did the work. No one here or here did the work, not one. They did to gain the state and harder still the national registry as an historic district. For me, facts and context matter. The SANS organization did the village's work every day for the past, not every day, but the first three years it felt like every day, but once a month, every whatever, to pull the information together for the village. Maybe that's why somebody said I'm pretty passionate. And you're right, you're pretty passionate when there was heavy listing and no shell to climb into like a hermit crab taking up space and the credit. Finally, Sands is of national importance and has been chronicled over the years. When you walk through the Sands area, you are walking through a living national historic site. It is a national historic site. That's what being listed on the registry means for national. Not something that should be disposable in the years to come. It is not just about a people, a person's social life and the generation. It is about the physical nature of how the planned community developed. That is the cultural importance. It's not that who was a neighbor and who, you know, we had breakfast together and the bells rang at a certain time. Yes, that's some of the character that happened, but it was designated based on the planned community developed at that time. That's the why and that's the what. 
This planned community rose up at the same time as Levittown. Levittown for primary res uh, residents with a covenant to exclude Blacks and Sands founded by two biracial sisters as second homes to welcome folks, particularly Blacks. Today, Levittown has its historical society and Sands is still waiting for its local designation. Sands is probably one of the biggest phenomena and historically important occurrences in this village. We talk about whaling, we talk about the captains. You should be talking about what happened in Sands. It is of historic importance and there are only five of this around the country. It used to be hundreds. Sands is mentioned in many places, including the National Museum of African American History. In the uh, um, floor that's called Place, and those of you who visited know there's a whole huge area just called Place. They didn't say landscaping, they said Place, okay? Sands is mentioned there, and we have now them, and, and, but we have not been acknowledged locally at, the, at this level. We have something in the National Museum, but we can't get this landed. And so tonight, you have an awesome responsibility, not just for those residents in the village today, or just for Sands residents. By the way, this is a village issue. It's not just a Sands issue. But for those who will be alive 50 years from now, you are the history keepers. Your names will be on these next steps. The SANS organization is accepting your word. I'm looking each of you in your eyes. Your word, which is in my family, is your honor. That you will engage the CLG process and launch the required effort for the SANS area without delay. And let me talk about, you don't need to work. I hear people now saying 24. That is only if you have new inventory. You already know what you have. You can do it tomorrow. And this is my last paragraph. Okay. We believe all data you need is already in the village's capable hands. This review is still your intention, right? Am I correct? You're still going to do the SANS review? There's silence. I'm letting you finish. Okay. I'm asking the question because my last sentence is thank you for. Um, equally ex being equally expeditious in this manner. And for us, justice delayed is justice denied. I'm finished. Um, I have one letter which I'm not going to read now. Maybe you get a letter, but I, I will give it to you rather than read it. It's from the planner who worked with us. Um, and we sent it to you today, but I don't know if you got it. I don't recall seeing it. Um, and there are attachments. So I, I won't, because it took time, I won't. It just came in at three. Okay. So here's a letter. You can make copy from them, but there are attachments to that. And I want to point out, this is the author who kicked us off, Andrew Call. This land was ours. And when we had the Guild First Big Public uh, Forum, he was the guest speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay, And he is an expert in this area. I'm sure he'll be making himself available. If he needs okay. Thank you, Renee. Um, uh, Kate, these are uh, some pieces that came in today as well that we should accept for the record. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, is there anyone else to be heard? Uh, yes, sir. My name is uh, Edward Dudley. I live at 44 Hillside Drive West, San Palmer Hills, San Palmer. And uh, I just want to be here to support my dear friend Renee Simon and Historic Dick District and ask you to put it in the registry. Although I'm, a, I'm opposed to this bill, I'm asking you to, to pass it because a vast majority of my friends and colleagues are in favor of it. And therefore, I, I do believe you should act on it. But I just want to tell you briefly how we came to Sag Harbor. I chose <clears throat> to retire here. Sag Harbor is far from perfect, but I love it very much. <sighs> On 
My father is a politician. And, and first, I want to thank all of you for your service because he was in politics and served many years. Uh, he was former president of Manhattan. He was an ambassador to Liberia. And uh, more importantly, he was a civil rights lawyer that worked for Thurgood Marshall against the separate but equal schools. And his, his trip to Sag Harbor is very important. He came from Roanoke, Virginia. And he left Roanoke where he grew up because he worked at a separate but equal school, which we know now were not equal. And he got half the pay of the white teachers. So he came to New York, but he was really a Southerner in heart. And so after working several years, he looked to come out to, to find a rural area, to find a place where he could fish and have friends and stuff. And he found Sag Harbor. At that time in the 40s, illegally, he and others were gerrymandered into this beautiful old oasis on Sag Harbor Bay. They didn't want blacks in Main Street and on Madison Avenue and on High Street. But we told our friends, my father told his friends, and it became an unbelievable community. As you read Sack Harbor Hill, in the it was 90% black. When we first came out, we stayed with the Norman family, Edna and Gerald Norman. That house is still owned by a Norman. Uh, my father uh, bought a house in Sack Harbor Hills a few years later, and uh, we lived there. My daughter, my youngest daughter, my, my boys went to school in, uh, in Scarsdale. My youngest daughter went to Sack Harbor School and grew up here. My son, Kevin, uh, married uh, a local girl from Sack Harbor. Many of you know her parents, Dr. John and Leah Oppenheimer. And my grandchildren come and they, they'd rather stay at my house in Sag Harbor Hills than John's house uh, over, in, over in Marcy because they can cross the street, eight and nine year old girls, and play next door with the neighbor, uh, Jay Lee, who lives across the street. But unfortunately, my father wasn't alive to see the, the hit that we got seven or eight years ago when a real estate trust found that our neighborhood, because it was 80 to 90 percent black, was substantially under, undervalued to the other properties in Sag Harbor. So what they did was they surreptitiously by hiring black brokers and black landscapers started buying up property. They went to old people and said, look, we'll pay all your taxes and everything. And when you die, sell us your property. We'll pay all, all your taxes. You can travel and do more things. And before we knew it, they had nothing illegal that they did. Nothing illegal, but before they did, they had 20 or 30 properties. So we've, we've taken a hit. Sag Harbor Hills, as you rest, the Nineveh will never be the same. The little girl who was, who was a young black girl who, who was the same age as my grandchildren, and that's why they love to come there. They can just cross the street and play with her. Well, they're leaving because the house they bought for about 400,000 that about seven or eight years ago, they've been offered 1.3 million, even though they've only put about 100,000. So the community is changing. But what bothers me is in this country, the misinformation about COVID and also about Sag Harbor, that to all my neighbors, it was spread that you won't be able to renovate your house. If Renee, who put as many hours or more than, than Bob Holland did, and she didn't get paid a penny. 
to get a designated a state historic site. A state historic site stands as you rest Sag Harbor. We are a state and federal historic site. So I support the, the, the bill that the majority of my fellow residents want, but I also urge and ask you as soon as possible to put in the local registry sands as a historic site, because that's what the law requires me to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dudley, appreciate it. I just want to tell you, uh, Mr. LaRoque, I don't really know you, uh, but when, when you ran for mayor, my dear friend, Bill Pickens, called me up and said, Ed, I know you're supporting the other mayor, but I want you to vote for, for Mr. LaRoque. And we had coffee and we talked about it. And then, you didn't convince me, but <laughs> I, I was wondering fact. where you were going with that. <laughs> I respected the fact that if he likes you, he must be a hell of a guy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. All right, we have uh, someone online. Uh, go ahead, Cass. Mr. Lewis. I was trying to unmute my um, my phone. I just want to um, say this, and I spoke at the the initial the initial hearing. I told the story about why we came out to Sag Harbor. The only concern I have with either proposal um, is that I don't. I don't think we should be limited in the use of our house beyond what Sag Harbor requires. And so I'm not saying that the overlay or the SANS proposal will restrict the use, but I'd like some assurance that we would be able to use our property to the full extent that is allowed within Sag Harbor. That's all I have to say, but I, I want to make sure that I go on record saying that. And you can respond if you, um, if you have an answer to it. All right, uh, uh, thank you. And I do recall your previous visit. Uh, uh, thank you for that as well. Um, are there any other comments or questions? Uh, uh, Lisa, Lisa, good to see you. Good evening. I'm Lisa Stenson Desimores of Hillside Drive West, president of the Sacramento Hills Improvement Association. I'm glad that my neighbor Ed Dudley spoke. Our families have had a deep connection, which I just want to describe briefly for you so you have an understanding of the depth of our community which has made it attractive for others to invest in. Ed's mother and my grandmother were dear friends in a women's organization together. I met Ed's niece, Sharon, in Sag Harbor when we were children. And even though we were in and out of touch over the years into adulthood, we reconnected because um, we always had the bond of our summers in Sac Harbor. And her daughter matriculates in college in New York. And when the pandemic hit, Sharon and her daughter asked if they may store her boxes um, at my home in Westchester. There are 10 boxes of Ed's niece's daughter in the basement of my home. And they're still there for over two years. And I've been happy, happy um, just to do that for the family. At the last public hearing last month, you heard from a descendant of the founders of Azure West, one of whom was an architect. And there was certainly an opportunity for the homes 
that were initially constructed in Azure REST to be of architectural significance. And there is, in fact, a home that uh, one of the founders did design and build in Virginia that is known for its architectural significance. The designation by New York State, as well as the listing of our community in the National Register of Historic Places is due to the following. Community planning and development, social history, Black and ethnic heritage. That is what the federal website specifies for the listing of SANS in the National Register of Historic Places. There is an area of significance that can be bestowed upon a property as architecture. Architecture is not deemed an area of significance for our SANS community. Architecture is, however, specified for Grand Central Terminal, for residences in Baltimore, for brownstones in New York City. Very different. We applaud the trustees for closely evaluating our tri-community working groups overlay district proposal and meeting with Errol Taylor, Steve Williams, and myself uh, in the past year and converting a proposal into a local law uh, that reflects what the majority of homeowners in our three communities want. They've made it abundantly clear and you've heard several other homeowners, we've received letters from homeowners as well who support the historically Black beachfront communities overlay district local law. Last, I just wanted to share in the past month, I met in person with an attorney named Mindy Stern, who I've known for more than 25 years. She is a partner at a law firm in New York City, uh, which has a deep bench in real estate practice. And when I discussed with her our proposal, as well as the alternate uh, proposal for architectural historic district, um, she immediately said, well, if your communities are placed into the architectural historic district, that will impose upon the homeowners significant expense because of the very rigid requirements that come with residences in a historic district. The historically Black beachfront communities overlay district proposal reflects the right balance of what our homeowners want, and we are hopeful that the trustees will support and Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> um, Kate, just quick, just very quick, 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 please. Very, sorry. I'm Katie Plum. I've lived in um, Azure Western mm -hmm. since 1983. And I feel that you have a moral obligation to take on this CLG designation that has obviously from Renee's um, discussion that the board, the village board, completely ignored and just did not pay any attention to the work that was done earlier. And I, I personally feel that this board in 2022 has a moral obligation to at first address and what you have not been able to do for other, you know, reasons which we don't have to go into or you know, and you know, but I, I, I just it's just so apparent to me to sitting here and listening to everything that. There's a uh, some uh, absence of responsibility and uh, moral, you know, imperative. 
to take on their their rights so what they in 2019 and 16 and previously that's my opinion thank you just respond you. to that go ahead yeah. sure go ahead. you know hey we've listened to both sides right we understand both sides of it the the, the, the part of the problem it, it, the, the biggest issue is the, the, the distinction between historical and preserved. And uh, I think it's largely a matter of size and scale myself as opposed to architecture. Frankly, I don't think that's necessarily our business. I think the members of SANS are, have gotten together, hammered out a pretty good compromise. And that's what I think. And I'm not sure it's up. It's, I don't feel like it's up to us to uh, tell them what to do, frankly. So, but I, I hear your point. And it's one, it's one side of, of a multi-sided story. Okay. Thank you, Kate. We're not gonna uh, have a debate, <laughs> but, but thank you. Um, was there another hand in the back? No. There's a hand up front. Steve? No, I thought that. <laughs> you can't miss Steve's hand in the back. <laughs> it touches the ceiling. Good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Williams. I'm from Azure West. Uh, like Lisa, the president of her owners association, I'm the president of the Address Property Owners Association. Absent tonight is Errol Taylor, who is the president of the Men of the Beach Property Owners Association. I'm not sure that. There is apparently some misunderstanding about what we're trying to do. My parents born in 1947. They finished the house in 53. Many of the neighbors in, on the waterfront, one block closer to the beach than I am, went a lot. Me and my wife are, I should say. Bought earlier in 47 than we did. <clears throat> now, some people have upgraded their house and, and moved in and increased it over the course of time. Some didn't. The, in 47, Black people were not getting loans from banks. We were being redlined. So a lot of this was done out of pocket, which is an amazing thing. I tell the story often that I was a surprise baby. My parents designed the house. They had their bedroom, my sister's room, and a guest room. I was born three weeks after the house. I so I wasn't in the design. I took over the desk. <laughs> so uh, that's how the house has stayed. Because it kind of worked with us. We were here during the summer. We're down here now year round full time. You have not heard from anybody who has a house that's a 1940 vintage that supports the program that SANS is trying to submit to you. Neither Mr. Dudley's house is in the original ranch configuration or Ms. Simon's house is in the original configuration. In fact, she raised the house on the property she bought. So now I'm faced with, if you decide to, to, to delegate us as a historic house, we have done improvements. We have done some extensions. Some of them might be 50 years in vintage. And for those of you who don't know, house has to be 50 years old to be contributing. And if it's contributing, it's eligible for historic designation. There are a lot of 50 year old houses across this country that are not historically designated. The problem with it is under the rules of historic designation, Whatever improvements they are cannot supersede or overwhelm what was original. So you might see a picture of somebody who some house has been an extension on it. That's fine. It can't be higher. The roof line can't be higher. Let's say I want to put a second floor for my son and hopefully my future grandchildren. I couldn't put on a second point. That is misinformation. That's it's not information. All right, we're not going to do this Excuse this me. way. Sir, uh, uh, Mr. Dudley, please. Um, let let uh, Mr. Williams speak, please. The 
Second floor roof line would have to be subservient to the ranch roof line. No. Eddie, you're not an expert in this. I know about this. Mr. Little Williams, little can you can you face the boards? So okay, but that's also for the, me. I didn't also for the Zoom that. to pick you up too. So thank you. Where we are is this. Two hundred and ten people said they want the zoning overlay district. That's within the three African American waterfront communities. Uh, that was recent. Only 10 people said they didn't want that. So just a quick, that's 95% of the residents. Of the three HOAs that don't want historic preservation because they feel that if their houses are locked under historic preservation and there are other houses that are free to continue to modify and do what they want, destroy and rebuild, change window sizes, colors, whatever, that it'll create two real estate markets within our community. Those that are market free and those are historically restrained. So if our families grow, if we have grandchildren, if we wanna do all the other things, we won't be able to do it to the extent that we want to. No absolutes, but to the extent that we might want to. Um, when the community was created, it was created to, to find a safe haven where people could have their children enjoy the summer, have their wives and families have a good time, be taken out of the, out of the anxiety that's caused during the summer in the cities. That's the heart of this community. That's why very wealthy Black people who could buy anywhere else in the country including East Hampton, South Hampton, Bridge Hampton, West Hampton, move into Sag Harbor and move into address Sag Harbor Hills and Inver Beach. Some of the houses in Inver Beach are worth $4 million, $5 million. They're occupied by African Americans. And there was a big case here about somebody who wants to build a pool on a, on, on, a, on a bluff, a high bluff, he did it. This, this house went for five and a half million dollars. So this whole stuff, we are regenerating now. We had eight people buy into Azurest. Five of them have started to improve their houses. They are building higher. They are building better. One woman who is the second vice president of Azurest Homeowners Association, took down its 800 square foot house and put up a 2,400 square foot house. So this would be restraint of our capability and our property rights. This is not some book in a museum. <coughs> I, we counted about five or six houses, maybe 10 in Azure Rest that would be constrained unfairly because of this. So, and I'd be one of them, so I'm a little passionate here. Um, I say to you that I spent five years working in this village, volunteering regarding historic preservation. I think I know more about it than, than some of the people who have spoken today. And I am sure that they have not studied the requirements that are the result of an act of Congress. The result of an act of Congress and administrated by the Department of the Interior. The CLG is not some freewheeling sort of entity that has been referred to. The certified local government is the local administrator of the federal law regarding historic preservation. Until you have read that Many hundred, four or 500 page book of rules and regulations, you're not really well familiar with it and you have to read it a couple of times. It includes 
how to maintain windows, when you can replace a window, when you can't replace a window, window size, window type. And here in the village, we don't like to go from single pane wood casements 150 years old to double pane uh, thermal pane windows. The board, the board is really, um, we don't like people to take shingle shakes and replace them with some sort of artificial material. Even the bank's financing rules are different. We know that 80, 20, 20% 20 deposit, 80% mortgage loan for, for most free market buildings. Many banks require 60, 40. 40% equity deposit uh, with a historic buildings because it's so much more expensive to maintain. Think about an asphalt roof shingle that is put on a roof in, in, in maybe a day or two, two days covers the average roof versus the cost of putting in individual cedar shakes one by one, lined up balanced. The manpower, the labor, the cost differences are obvious. So that's what we're talking about, a, a, a effort to make a museum of old, no longer functional houses versus allowing the founders, their children, their grandchildren, and the new members to thrive in the community they created and to manipulate their real estate and their property in such of a way that it serves them their highest and best use. That's the question. Versus an organization that does not re represent the three homeowners associations, does not represent the work of 17 members from the representative of each of these homeowners associations, the years and years of work. <coughs> when when, when <coughs> it started, I can talk about myself. I wrote a $500 check to support the idea. It was cultural, it was heritage, it was not architecture. So it seems to have gone off on a different course. Now, I'm going to finish with this. The three, you know, you stay on the right side of history. Someone's using that phrase. Let me tell you this. The three organizations, the three owners of those organizations have decided they're going to do what SANS, we think, expect, we expected them to do. And that is we're going to get together and put together our collective history of the three Black beachfront communities since 1947 and before uh, going forward. We think it is important to, to, to have the history of, of my Uncle Ed, Ed Dudley's father. I, but it was a sort of community that my father, and I'll, I'll, I'll be short, I'm gonna, this is too long. It's a sort of community where my dad and his dad used to drive back and forth on weekends. I would be with them in the car. His father would challenge my brain, my intellect, my understanding, philosophy. But he never told me, Uncle Eddie never told me he worked for Thurgood Marshall until he was at a lawn party in our backyard. And I was probably, I was already married to my wife. So I'm saying it wasn't about who we are and what we did. It's just about, we had a community of family, people with the same principles, the same ideas, but who, who wanted their children and their wives to flourish. That's the legacy. That's the history. I want to do that for my son. Renee's done that for her children. Eddie's done that for his children. They have 300 or 3,000, 4,000 square foot houses. I want to have the right to take my 1,800 square foot house and expand it as I need. With that, I'll say thank you for your very generous time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Steve. We have someone. Uh, on Zoom.
Hello. You Hi. hear me? Yes, uh, please tell us your name and where you live. This is Gregory Greatfield Sujay at 8 Soundview Drive. I wholeheartedly support everything that Steve Williams has said. I'm not sure what Ed Dudley said. I was a prior president of the Sag Harbor Hills Improvement Association. And one year, there was an issue about whether or not the parking lot Labor Day party would occur in Azure Arrest. And the issue was that Anita Rainford was using her credit card to pay for the arrangements. There was a rumor spread from a friend of Eglin Simons that I stopped the party because I would not uh, transfer money from Sag Harbor Hills Improvement Association to uh, Azure Rest. Now, I got to tell you that Ed signed off on the credit transfer of money to Anita Rainford. Uh, and it was, a, it was a rumor spread that Eglin Simons and um, also Renee Simons spread about me. And of course, um, I was referred to as not the good president, but he was the good president uh, elect. He was my uh, vice president. So uh, I don't, I would discredit whatever Ed Dudley said, but I would give full faith and credit to what Steve Williams has said in support of the historically black. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sujay, if I may, um, we've had an extended conversation um, and uh, I'd like to avoid any um, personal commentary. Um, it's not personal. It's, it's personal. Well, I tell you, these stories are uh, 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 hitting up against that, that, that barrier. Uh, and we want to keep it to the subject that we have. And uh, you started um, in terms of uh, talking to the question before us. And uh, I wonder if I could ask you to finish up with that because uh, uh, that's what we, we certainly need to address here uh, officially. So, Mr. Sujay, are you still there? I think that's the phone on the computer. I think he might have a phone and a computer on at home and he's getting oh, feedback and feedback to it. Yeah. All right. I well, asked Cassie to mute just till he got that. Yeah. So he got it organized. Huh? Okay. He's <clears throat> I think I think he made his comments. Right. Can we move on? All right. Um Cass, do you have anybody else? All right, anyone else here to be heard that has not been heard before? All right, uh, to remind, we are in, um, uh, in an open public hearing that uh, has now been um, uh, available for these two meetings. Um, and this week we uh, received the last of the referrals that we're obliged to get, and that was from the Suffolk County. And so uh, we have in hand um, all of the, uh, they're not, approvals, they're just uh, uh, documents that confirm that we've uh, run this uh, issue past uh, and alerted uh, all of the affected governments, and um, we have all those referrals in hand. So I would ask my colleagues if you're ready to uh, uh, close the public hearing, uh, having seen no more uh, I'll commentary. make a motion to close it. Uh, Tom, is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Ed? Um, all those in favor of the motion to close the public hearing indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The hearing is closed. Um, and would now hear, the chair would now hear a motion on um, the um, local law um, uh, motion to adopt uh, the local law. I'll move it. Uh, Ed Hay, is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, Tom Gardella. Um, are there any further comments among the trustees? No. All right, thank you. Um, uh, would I call the vote? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
the local law is adopted. I thank you all. I thank um, all of the good people who've come here tonight. I know this has been a long journey. And uh, I will tell you from the seat that I occupy, we will work with you on the CLG process as we have uh, uh, promised to do. Um, I would call then the next up on is, um, <clears throat> uh, we have some action items. Um, the first quite routine is to accept the 2022 bank rec reconciliations and collateral reports for October. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? There are none. Though. Okay. No, no there are none. So they would have been listed if they were. Um, next up, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. The, the matter is agreed to. Um, uh, next up, uh, uh, Nat Pagosi of the Sag Harbor Inn requests permission to erect a menorah on the grassy area of Long Wharf to celebrate Hanukkah uh, commencing on December 14th. Uh, good night, folks, and thank you. Good night. Thank good you. Night. I'll make um, a motion. I'll second. So eight and second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is agreed to. Uh, Robert Borey, Harbor Master, requests authorization to hire Jack Riser as dock master at the rate of $25 per hour, effective December 16th. I'll make a motion. Second. Um, uh, thank you. I would just observe that Mr. Riser has an outstanding background in public service in this community and the neighboring colony of North Haven. And uh, uh, we have had a model from time to time here where in addition to the harbor master, there is a dock master who is the presence uh, in the hour to hour, day to day. And so I think this is a very a good opportunity for the, uh, for the village. And I'm uh, happy to move um, this item. Uh, is there a second? I already made a motion. Yeah. You already made the motion. Yeah. Second and we okay. all agree. Ready, yeah. ready to roll. roll. Okay. I don't know uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The matter is agreed to. Thank you. And thank you, Bob, for bringing this forward. Um, next up, um, uh, authorization for the funding of the fire department boat reserve from insurance recovery funds. Uh, Tom, do you want to speak to that? Well, we had an incident with the current boat during the last storm. It was damaged. As you know, the boat we got from Southampton town. So the marina says it's not worth putting the money that we got from the insurance company into the boat. So what we've decided to do is to take the funds and put them in the boat reserve for the purchase of the new boat, which I believe was $24,050. So, so that'll just add to that. Reserve. Are you going to have boat in time for the summer? <laughs> May first. <laughs> no, seriously. Well, I, that I don't know. Yeah. From your lips to God's ears. Just just money. Money. So, <laughs> so okay. but you can see now how this is a very important subject that we have to. You know, we're yeah. going to have to. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have, you know, Council Whites is working on the paperwork with Dasney for the grant. What we're going to have to do is match that two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And through the donations, we're getting there. We're almost there. How long would it take to get a boat from the time it gets ordered to get specified and delivered crane? It could take, it could take a year. It could take yeah. two years. They're not on the shelves. No, no, they're made to order. Yeah. But there's a whole procurement process we have to go through. Right. So, and so what it's coverage... possible there could be a boat out there that meets all the specs. Sure. And what coverage does that leave us boat-wise for the summer? I believe we have one of the boat in Noyak that's still that we use for the Noyak protection area. But that the big boat that we got from the town a number of years ago. Right. Stayed here for okay. So we have a boat we do have right a boat. here in the harbor. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a, that was my question idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And to the harbor master's boat is also is also a critical a part of most of the, the responses. The problem is had. that the, the capacity for to, to pump water. To, to extinguish a fire. And it's not, as I said before, it's not just a boat fire. We have a, quite a few residents that live on the water or near the water. So to be able to hit that one exposure from the bay side, is, it gives us that extra capability. All right, sounds good to me. Okay. Um, so I'll make the motion. Second. Tom, second. Ed, uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Matter is agreed to. Uh, 
Next up, a motion to authorize the use of funds from the sewer reserve account for the repair and installation of an influent pump. I think that's the first time I've ever heard that word. Um, I'll move it. it. I'll second it. Um, and the repair further? and install of the influent pump likely caused by grease. Okay. All those, oh, sorry. Uh, all those. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, Ian wants to get this done right away. So, yeah. um, aye. Uh, all those in favor indicate by <laughs> saying aye. I'm Opposed? Aye. The matter is agreed to. Um, Clerk Administrator Kate Lacazio requests permission to attend the 2023 Long Island Village Elections Workshop on January 12th in Hophog, New York. Is there a motion? I'll move. Okay. A second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 The matter is agreed to. Um, uh, Missy Hessler, president of the Volunteer Ambulance Corps, requests authorization to hire Roger Levisica and uh, Michael Bohm has uh, paid EMT drivers. Is there a motion, uh, Tom? I'll, I'll make the motion. A second. Um, this is a routine uh, renewal of go, yeah, they'll people. Yeah, they part of the schedule, you know. Uh, constantly, people are constantly turning over. There, there's actually a crisis in the county as far as paid people taking the classes, people, young people getting involved and taking on these jobs. So when we have people that are available, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta sure. hire them. Indeed. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Matter is agreed to. Um, Richard Scavoni, Secretary of the Fire Department, requests the board to accept the resignation of Jared Warwick in good standing and remove him from the insurance rolls. Is there a I'll, motion? I'll make the motion. Second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. That is approved. Um, subject to permissive referendum for the expenditure of money from the ambulance equipment reserve account for the purchase of turnout gear. Um, is there a motion? I'll make the motion. Tom, this is a periodic renewal yes. of the gear. Um, is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, number 10, authorizing notice to proposers for an RFP for the Long Wharf Transient Dock replacement and expansion, which is what I mentioned uh, earlier in the report. It's uh, uh, launching the process that we hope will yield in uh, getting good uh, good bids and getting the transient dock in motion. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, the matter is agreed to. Uh, next up, subject to a permissive res referendum for the expenditure of money from the capital reserve account for the purchase of ambulance equipment. Um, I believe this is for the first this responders. This is for the first responders, yes. So we're replacing two of the first responders. The money's already in the budget, but we need to move it from the capital reserve. There's just a small um, right. portion that we didn't cover, so we're going to the- This is the, this is the vehicles. These right. are the two vehicles, yeah. yeah. Which get quite the work out. Um, uh, is there a motion? I'll make the motion. A second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Next up, resolution number, uh, unnumbered yet, to increase employee compensation to help offset the impacts of high inflation. Um, this is an effort uh, that uh, I and my colleagues have discussed at, at some length. Um, if you look at the rate of inflation, which is, uh, some commentators are saying, well, it's eased a little bit, but. Uh, uh, we're going to finish the year at between seven and eight percent, um, and uh, the um, there, are, there are not many periods in our history where that has been sustained for uh, very long without doing real harm to the economy. And um, while that is happening, uh, we have found on a national basis that the median income in the country uh, did not grow. Uh, significantly last year, but the median house cost in the country uh, grew substantially, in some cases um, uh, by 50 and 60%. So the economy, the difficulties in the economy are such that um, uh, we reviewed where we are financially uh, midway through our fiscal year, and we're in a position to, uh, uh, to offer a two and a half percent inflation adjustment to all village uh, employees. Um, and uh, I would uh, like to make the motion and urge that we uh, consider this favorably. Um, we've done it uh, a year ago 
and uh, uh, was helpful to our uh, hardworking employees. Uh, this is a motion to include everybody, including the police, um, and uh, to have it in, uh, in effect effective on January 1. I'll second it. Uh, second, thank you, Tom. Um, and just so you know, this does not include us. That's the question. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I preempt you. It should be. No. No, it does not include the board. Right. Um, just for your information, Kate, uh, we cannot vote to increase our own compensation. <laughs> we can only vote to do it for a future board. Yeah. So, but that's not tonight. All okay. Right. So, um, uh, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The matter is agreed to. Thank you. Um, next up is a, a, motion, a resolution to authorize the use of reserve funds representing the proceeds from paid parking from sidewalk uh, for sidewalk repair. Um, we have met um, uh, uh, a number that we, at least I was skeptical that we would see, but we've seen it. And uh, uh, the motion um, that uh, the resolution before us is uh, to uh, assign the use of those funds. And I think that we have an amended version of it. Yeah. Um, so just go ahead, to give you a break out the total um, net, net receipts from paid parking for 2021 2022, $144,902.85. And discussions with uh, Tom D. Uh, D. Yardley, uh, we have agreed to assign it as follows $90,000 to the account for sidewalk repair. And to give you some idea, perspective, our annual repair allocation is $30,000. Last year we spent 60. We saw a lot of work in the village because we skipped a year for COVID. So $90,000 plus the 30 of the regular allocation will make a huge difference to sidewalk repair in the village. Um, we also are allocating $20,000 to drainage. We have drainage issues throughout the village. So that'll allow for some uh, work to, done, to be done on drainage and $20,000 for roads. And I believe we were leaving $15,000 $15, in a reserve for some other issues that come up. This is going to be great work. It's infrastructure work for the village paid for by paid parking. And we know that most of that, the vast majority is coming from um, our guests from out of town in the summer. And I thank everyone for their support for this. I want to thank you, Trustee Kors, for taking the initiative on this when you did with the paid parking. And now we're finally seeing the fruits of that labor. You know, I, I was kind of questioned it as far as the residents paying, but it turns out that the residents aren't paying. The first responders don't pay for paid parking. So majority of this money is coming from tourists that come to visit our village and exactly. it's getting put right back into the infrastructure. So thank right. you. Thank you very much, Tom. And I'll move this. Uh, is there a second? Second. I'd like to thank the people who pay it are happy to pay it. I think they are too. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is agreed to. Uh, next up, at number 14, um, a resolution coordinating lead agency in connection with the proposed sewer extension to Sewer Shed Key and Sewer Shed L pursuant to the New York State um, Environmental Quality Review Act. Uh, Aidan, do you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, as we progress this project, uh, CEQA is required um, on the proposal. So this is resolution is to uh, coordinate, uh, coordinate the agency. The agency. Um, and so can you explain that a little further? So it just means that you're going to request lead agency status as the board that will be in charge of conducting the secret review. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to coordinate lead agency with other involved agencies um, under CICRA. And that means this will be um, referred to those other agencies to see if there's another lead agency request from those people. And they have the agencies have 30 days to get back to you after 30 days you can make your determination of significance and move forward with CICRA okay. as lead agency, if no one else If no one else has, right. has, okay. Well, this will be a very important part of moving this project forward. We've already um, received some grant funding for it. So this, the ball is rolling on this and hopefully we'll have some good news next month from the state. Is this Rising Street? Uh, no, this is not Rising Street. This is um, Surshed K, which you can essentially look at the, the, the west, uh, west of Main Street. Uh, Meadow, Rose, uh, all the way around down Long Island Avenue, that's very low lying area. And then L is East, which would include parts of Rising Street, but it's a much bigger area. Um, these maps are available on the, the village on the website. website. Yeah. So I'll move, so you this. move it. Yep. Uh, is there a second? I'll second it. Tom, thank you. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The matter is agreed to. Next up, number 15, um, resolution. 
uh, for additional engineering services related to Long Wharf Transient Marina Expansion Project. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, Bob, uh, a necessary step in that trail to uh, uh, produce, I guess, the- The, the bid packets. The, the, the yeah. bid packets. Oh, the bid the, packages. The, the yes. bid packages. Which is quite right. a big job. Yeah, yeah, so there were some changes along the way in just going forward, so there's just additional services. So this is updating the- yeah. I'll, I'll make the, the motion. I'll second it. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 The matter is agreed to. Um, and uh, next section, approve, approval of the payment of bills. Um, I'd like to take these together in bank. Uh, motion to approve the payments represented, represented in warrant number 27, 28, 29, um, 30, and 31. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. The uh, motions are agreed to. There is one more public uh, comment session. And sir, you've been very patient. Uh, appreciate your being here. Thank you. Um, you come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rachel O'Brien, president of the Harbor Close Condominiums, 18 Bridge Street. Uh, I just have one information I'd like to pass along to the village. Sure. If you wouldn't mind two follow up questions. Um, we were alerted, I guess, about a month or two ago about a uh, expansion of some docks off the Beacon restaurant. Uh, it was proposed by SGI Marinas. It's currently in the hands of the Army Corps of Engineers for an application. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this or not. And we sent a letter of opposition to it. And I was hoping that we could have your support and also the opposition of this dock. If they want to, they want to tear down 45 feet of the existing dock and expand it to 93 feet. It's a very small area. If you're familiar with that area, sure. And, uh, and this is who? Which marina is it? It's the private marina that's by the Beacon Restaurant. Immediately west or behind. But the uh, actual dock would be southwest. To the south. Go out and navigate the waters from the from the cables. We go out around that. Got it. Got it. It's a small little area. They want to make it actually even smaller. Okay, Mr. O'Brien, I have not seen it. I, I would have, I would appreciate your yeah. leave. I uh, thank you for alerting us to it. Um, that, that's this has yeah. to go through. Let's go through a formal. This stock has to go through a formal process, which that, is the my, Harbor Committee. My, my question is, yeah. how can they do this? I can't without the village being notified because I believe they did it also once before. The adjoining docks of White Barons Cove. It's the same group. We have a letter that we sent to the Army Corps of Engineers. It seems like State Hall was totally bypassed on this. When, when did this surface, so far as you know? This, this is dated September 13th. It's currently, we, we were time sensitive to respond to it. We had, I believe it was 10 days to right. respond to it. So we, I had half the people in the community, the condo community, signed off on and it. This. And as the agency involved is. It's currently in the, the Army, Army Corps of Engineers. Okay. The, so that's, give us the file, right. and uh, I promise you we will, we will have a look. Okay. And, uh, I'd, I'd uh, like to follow up with two other questions sure. that have nothing to do with this. The second thing would be with the Potter project that's on the on proposed for Bridge Street. Right. Um, we, as this common unit, has been approached in other projects, the owners have received certified letters of their proposal. That's never been done yet. Is that something that should be done or has can can no the owners have never was, been notified? Yeah, there was no public hearing. Usually you get notified by certified mail and there's okay. a public hearing schedule. So we just have to wait until it gets to that point. And yeah, you can check the agendas to see notified. what it's on the agenda. Um, but uh, here you we get a certified mailing only when there's a um, public hearing. And that's on the responsibility of the builder. It's a responsibility usually of the, the applicant. Okay. And and the code dictates who they have to notify, whether right. it's abutting or across the street. Right. right? So you'd have to okay. check that. Thank you. And the last the last issue I'd like to bring up, I noticed that the parking lights in the back have been replaced by LED, and I think they did an excellent job. Was that recently? Are you guys familiar with that? Um I'm um, not sure. Huh? Some of the those are D Yardley has been systematically when he replaces a fixture has been converting it to LED. 
And we have a program that we're going to start to work on where all the street lights are going to be replaced with LED. These are not these are like high intensity lights for the parking. The reason why I bring this up is we had two existing lights on our property, but illuminating our right. property. And they were they were recently removed. And their explanation, Lampa's explanation was that they were vapor lights and they wanted to put in LEDs and LEDs were not permitted on the Southampton ruling. And now I never as heard a result of that. that, I see new LEDs and I'm currently the Morley agency is in contact with Lampa to try to have these lights put back. And the latest I heard was that since we're not within the village, our location is not within the village. All I'm trying to do is have the lights replaced. Yeah, well, well, you, lights. Could, yeah. you are in the village. You are in the village. The We're, you're, you there. are very much in the village. Yeah, yeah. I told, I, I was on a conference call with a woman yesterday. She said she has to do small work into it. But Sounds like that. that. I, would say, I think we should <laughs> refer this. We'll I'm refer this to D. Yeah, we never had. sure. We had the lighting done. It was removed. They gave the reason of an LED, and now I, I know the LEDs are already in the village. Yes, they are. And to your understanding, it is uh, LIPA that removed them? Yes. All right. All right. If you would give us, give me a letter, something I can start with. Have, I have it home. Right. I'll okay. And as, as I said, we're in the process of changing the fixtures throughout the village. So. LIPA's come back from the dead, I guess. It's PSE&G. Well, PSE&G is the contractor to LIPA. LIPA is the authority. Uh -huh. Okay, just thank you for the alert. You alerting to us all kinds of stuff we haven't heard. Yeah, Very helpful. Well, we've been building up the last few months, but my question is, would you guys support us? Because it's going to cost. You know, we we've been having contractors come in. It's really dark now, and it's it's going to be really a lot of money for us to replace these lights if we have to do it. I'll get over there in the next couple of days with D. Yardley, and we'll have a look and. We'll be back to you. The actual location is both driveways, one on Bridge and one on Long Island Avenue. Okay. That they did remove. Before. Leave me before you go. Leave me a number for you. Okay. And uh, if we're going over, I'll give you a call, or we'll go by okay, and then we'll great. talk to you. May I have a question? Just, yes. It, were these light fixtures? Are they on private property, public property, light for property? It's on, it's on their pole. It's on the public right away. It's on, it's on there. there. That was my next question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. But we did look into replacing it because it's really dark now and we don't have that kind of money. Okay. To be honest with you. So okay. you know, I would appreciate your support to, to just get back what we had. I'm not asking for anything we didn't have already. Right. I understand and I appreciate you bringing it to us and on the other as well. Thank you. So Thank you. We're, we're, yes. I will give that to Kate if yes. you would. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks right. for the information. Thank you very much. Um, is there anybody else to be heard in the public comments? All right. I uh, see no hands. Anybody else, uh, Cass, electronically? All right. Um, that concludes the meeting. Thank you very much. We're on the uh, cusp of the holiday season. I want to just say to everybody, uh, our best wishes uh, for joy and good times in the holidays. Better year ahead. Um, and we'll hear a motion to adjourn. I'll move it. Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye.